Hello, this is Martin Kessler, and I'd like to continue sharing with you the primary teachings about the Anointed One from Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. This one is entitled, Teaching of the Laying on of Hands. Let me introduce this subject and give you the context from which we're working. These six primary things about the Anointed One are listed in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. And there we find some things that are foundational, and then there is additional teaching. We've already looked at a change of one's thinki thinking, and we've t talked about faith toward God, and we just completed a series of teachings about baptisms. And so we'll abandon that subject for a little while, and we'll move on to the laying on of hands. These six teachings can be looked at as points of a six-pointed star. We've looked at the two on the right, a change of thinking and faith toward God. We've looked at the one on the bottom, and now we're moving around clockwise to the laying on of hands. First of all, I'd like to outline what I'm going to be talking about during the next uh, half hour or so. The outline will include these subjects, a laying on of hands and the transfer of guilt. Number two, a laying on of hands and the imparting of a blessing. Number three, a laying on of hands and the gift of the Holy Spirit. Number four, a laying on of hands and the commissioning of a person for some special service. And the laying on of hands and the healing of the sick. And then I'll lay out one general principle that's given with a few comments afterwards and share with you what I think the proper response would be to this teaching. So let's begin. Number one, a laying on of hands and the transfer of guilt. This one is a concept that comes from the Old Testament. Maybe it's not too applicable except to give us some insight into what happened to our Lord Jesus. Let me explain. The book of Leviticus gives directions to the Israelites to instruct them how to uh, deal with their sacrifices. When the Israelites laid their hands on the head of their sacrifices, we find that the Lord accepted the sacrificial animal in their behalf. It was as though there was a transfer of guilt from that person to the animal, and then the animal suffered the consequences of the person's guilt. Where do we find that? Leviticus chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Follow along as I read. If the offering is a burnt offering from the herd, he is to offer a male without defect. He must present it at the entrance to the tent of meeting so that it will be acceptable to the Lord. He is to, and notice this, lay his hand on the head of the burnt offering and it will be accepted on his behalf to make atonement for him. So, here is the principle, a person laid his hands on the animal, his guilt was basically transferred to the animal, and then the animal suffered the consequences. This is a lamb, uh, less than a year old, and we know from the New Testament that Jesus is called the Lamb of God, and it's because of things that correspond to such things that he is called this. Consider how the Jews laid hands on Jesus. Luke chapter 22, verses 53 to the first part of 54, indicate the words that Jesus said to those who were about to arrest him, representatives of the, the leaders of Israel. He, he said to them, every day I was with you in the temple courts, and you did not stretch out a hand upon me. There we have a reference to stretching out one's hand and laying it upon that person. However, Jesus continues, this is the hour that is yours and the authority of the darkness. Luke doesn't go on to say specifically that 
hands were laid on him, consequently, but Matthew does. In Matthew chapter 26, verse 50b, we read, and this follows in this account uh, directly after what Jesus must have said uh, in, in Luke. Then having approached, they what? They laid the hands on the Jesus, and they seized him. And what a picture that is. Here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, and hands were laid upon him. Um, it's something to think about, and it's something to uh, consider as you read through the Passion of our Lord. Here you see one of the temple guard laying his hand upon Jesus. Number two, a laying on of hands and the imparting of a blessing. This might be more applicable to us. Jesus blessed little children by laying hands on them. We read, for example, one of the accounts of this in Mark chapter 10, verse 16. And having taken the little children, and I might just point out that these were tiny little tykes, the same word that is used in the uh, Gospel of Luke is the same word that's used even for unborn children. So these were very small children, little toddlers, little infants. They were mothers were bringing these children to Jesus. And we read, and having taken the little children up in his arms, having laid the hands on them, he was blessing them. So here's a, a picture. This little type isn't exactly in his lap yet, but Jesus is laying his hand on upon him and blessing him. Another example of the same kind of thing is when Jacob laid hands on Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh, and blessed them. Uh, you'll see that uh, Jacob crossed his hands because he meant to bless the younger one with more blessings than the older one, which made uh, his father Joseph a little unhappy, but nonetheless, this was God's will and uh, there was a good reason for that. Number three, a third example of laying out of hands in the Bible. A laying out of hands and the gift of the Holy Spirit. This one stands out to me as being connected best with the previous teaching about baptisms, because we find that the second baptism, the baptism of the Holy Spirit, was often accompanied by the laying out of hands and perhaps that's the main reason why this particular uh, subject comes up directly after the baptisms. That's my guess, but whatever it means, we're going to talk about it a little bit again. The Holy Spirit was received by means of the laying on of hands. Where do we find this? In Acts chapter 8, verses 14 to 19, we read about an anomaly that occurred as the gospel was first making its way into the Samaritan population, a second uh, layer of humanity that the gospel message was penetrating at that time. And it seems that God punctuated that with something quite special. We read in Acts chapter 8, verse 14, Now after the apostles in Jerusalem heard that the Samaritans had lastingly received the word of God, they commissioned the well-known Peter and John to them who came down and were praying for them in order that they might receive the Holy Spirit. Apparently, in every other way, they had responded to the proclamation of the excellent announcement as they should have. They believed it. They were baptized. But uh, for, for God's own reason, they did not receive the Holy Spirit as was normal even by that time. We go on, verse 16, for not even yet had he lastingly fallen upon any of them. Now they were only ones having been lastingly baptized as far as the name of Jesus, of the anointed one, Jesus. Then they were laying the hands upon them and they were receiving the Holy Spirit. So here's a reference to the laying on of hands and a connection with the receiving of the Holy Spirit. And this is perhaps the strongest connection we have in the New Testament. Here's a picture of uh, John and Peter, Peter being on the right side of the picture, laying hands on some of these Samaritans. And you notice to Peter's right, 
there's a man with a money bag offering him money. And that's relevant to what we find happening next in this account. Simon was the uh, man's name. He was a former uh, sorcerer of sorts, and he had the wrong idea about what he could expect. We read in verse 18, Now Simon, having observed that by means of the laying on of hands of the apostles, the Holy Spirit was being given. He brought money to them, saying, Give also to me this authority, in order that upon whomever I might lay the hands, he might receive the Holy Spirit. Now Simon's thinking was perverse, to be sure, because he thought he could buy this privilege of laying hands on people to receive the Holy Spirit. He was rebuked for that. However, what he observed was true, that by means of the laying on of the hands of the apostles, the Holy Spirit was being given. Later on, Ananias laid hands on Saul, the one who became Paul, for Saul to do two things, to receive his sight so he was healed, but also to be filled with the Holy Spirit. And apparently, Timothy received the gift of the Holy Spirit when he became a disciple of Jesus as the Apostle Paul laid hands on him. Here's an artist's conception of that event. We read about Peter, uh, Paul's laying hands on Timothy in the second letter that Paul wrote to Timothy, the first chapter, beginning at verse 6. For the sake of the faith which is in you, Paul writes, I am reminding you, Timothy, to rekindle the charisma. That's a transliteration of the Greek word there, showing that this is a special spiritual gift to which Paul is referring. It was common among Christians to demonstrate uh, that they immediately had some gift from the Holy Spirit immediately upon being baptized. So Paul is reminding Timothy of this special gift from God, which is in you, he says, by means of what? The charisma from God is in you by means of the laying on of the hands that are mine. So clearly Paul is the one who laid hands on Timothy, whereupon he received the gift of the Holy Spirit and the accompanying spiritual gift that the Holy Spirit gave to him. Paul goes on and writes, For the God has not given to us a spirit characterized by cowardice, rather a spirit characterized by power and agape, which is uh, the Greek transliteration of, or the English transliteration of this Greek word uh, for love, a special kind of love a self-sacrificial love, an intelligent love, and so on, and self-moderation. If you look at that list of three things that the Spirit is characterized and that are communicated to a person, you see that these are things that God gives to everyone who receives the gift of the Holy Spirit. All receive power. All receive a, the ability to produce spiritual fruit, like agape love and self-moderation, or as it is listed in another list, self-control. So this was brought to Paul or to Timothy by means of the laying on of Paul's hands. And so this apparently became the habit and characteristic feature of the early Christian church. Here is a, a picture of a hands being laid on an on an unidentified Roman soldier. But that it became common practice and was well known, uh, we find evidence of that, for example, in the writings of Hippolytus. Uh, bear in mind, he's writing in the first part of the third century. So this is quite some time after the death of the apostles, and, <clears throat> and it demonstrates that this was a continuing uh, practice in the Christian church. He writes, and the overseer shall lay his hands upon the newly baptized, Invoking and saying, O Lord God, who did count these worthy of deserving the forgiveness of sins by the labor of regeneration. Now, of course, there he's referring to baptism because the labor contained the water with which these newly, uh, uh, these new, new believers were baptized and regeneration was one of the blessings of that baptism with water. 
So he, he says, who did count these worthy of deserving the forgiveness of sins by the labor of regeneration. Make them worthy to be filled with your Holy Spirit and send upon them your grace that they may serve you according to your will. So you see in this passage that Hippolytus indicated that the laying on of hands accompanied this prayer for the reception of the Holy Spirit. Please remember, though, that the laying on of hands was not absolutely necessary for receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit. For example, the apostles and many disciples received the Holy Spirit on Pentecost without it. it the Holy Spirit simply descended upon them, uh, accompanied by flames of tongues of fire and a violent wind. And also we find that as the gospel broke into the full-fledged gen uh, Gentile population, uh, as another marker, God did something extraordinary, and Cornelius and his friends received the Holy Spirit without the laying on of hands themselves, too. Number four, the laying on of hands and the commissioning of a person for some special service. We'll see a variety of services uh, which, to which people were commissioned, and this was often accompanied by the laying on of hands. Barnabas and Saul were commissioned for a special missionary journey with the laying on of hands. We read about this in Acts chapter 13, verses 1 to 3. Particularly note uh, Barnabas and Saul, because those are the ones upon whom uh, hands were laid. They appear in a list that you'll see shortly. Now, there were certain ones in Antioch in relation to the existing assembly of those called out who were prophets and teachers. Both Barnabas and Simeon, the one being called by the surname Niger, Lucius and the Cyrenian, both Manaean, a companion of Herod the Tetrarch, and Saul. Now, while they were performing godly service for the Lord and fasting, the Holy Spirit said, Distinguish at this point Barnabas and Saul in regard to the work to which I have lastingly summoned them for myself. At that time, having fasted and having prayed, and having laid the hands upon them, they departed. Consequently, Barnabas and Saul, who became known better as Paul, traveled on their first missionary journey and shared the, the excellent announcement with many, many people. But it began here, with their being set apart for this service, with, accompanied by the laying on of hands. Here is an artist's uh, conception of that event. And here are a few other examples. According to Acts chapter 6, verse 6, the apostles laid hands on deacons to set them apart for their special service to the widows in Jerusalem. And here's how an artist depicted that. It seems that some special service to the Lord was also bestowed on Timothy along with the laying on of hands. And this is distinct from the laying on of hands that Paul did, because Paul himself was involved in that. You'll find that others were involved in this particular laying on of hands. In 1 Timothy chapter 4, verse 14, Paul writes to his young, younger co-worker, Stop having no care for the gracious divine gift which is in you, which was given to you by means of a prophecy, along with a laying on of the hands of the Council of Elders. Now, what exactly this uh, gracious divine gift was is uncertain. Perhaps some kind of leadership which he was granted or some other type of ministry. But no matter what, it was accompanied by a prophecy and the laying on of the hands of the Council of Elders. A fifth way or thing that the laying on of hands accompanied. A laying on of hands and the healing of the sick. Jesus healed many by a laying on of hands. We read in Luke chapter 4, verse 40, While the sun was setting, all those who had any who were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And laying the hands on each one of them, he was healing them. 
So Jesus practiced the laying on of hands in his healing ministry. Here's a picture of Jesus healing a little boy who has a head problem, and here another child who has something wrong, perhaps with his eye. Jesus promised that believers would lay hands on the sick and they would get well. Mark chapter 16, verses 17 to 18, words that the Lord spoke after his resurrection and before he ascended into heaven to his apostles included these. Now indicators or signs alongside of those who have believed shall follow closely. Follow that is the proclamation of this excellent announcement of peace through Jesus Christ. What are these indicators? Well, in the name that is mine, Jesus said, they shall cast out demons, they shall speak in new tongues, they shall remove snakes, that probably means snake-like characters that have infested the church. Even if ever they might drink anything deadly, it shall by no means hurt them. And finally, he adds, they shall lay hands on sick ones, and note what he says, and they shall be well. Additional teaching about healing. James gives directions to those who are sick. They should ask the elders of the assembly of those called out to pray for them and anoint them with oil. Laying on of hands isn't specifically mentioned there. Um, perhaps, though, the believers did that in addition. And 1 Corinthians indicates uh, that Paul said that the Holy Spirit would give to certain disciples gifts of healing that they then distributed according to the Holy Spirit's will. There's one general principle, short but to the point, and then I want to uh, have share with you some closing, closing thoughts. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 22, uh, this follows a discussion about elders. And, of, and it's likely that the elders also were individuals who entered their position of leadership in these Christian uh, assemblies uh, by way of the laying on of hands. In any case, Paul wrote to Timothy, be laying hands on not even one person quickly. Uh, I can understand why he would say that. If, you, if Christians got the idea that God could accomplish many things through the laying on of hands, as we've just seen, uh, they might get a little crazy about that and start laying on hands on anybody and everybody willy-nilly without thinking clearly about what they're doing and whether this was the appropriate time to do it and so forth. And so here is uh, Paul's warning to Timothy, don't do that too quickly, not even to one person. Be, take serious thought about it, this every time that you do it. The verse continues with a, a couple of other exhortations, nor be participating in the moral failures of others. Keep yourself set apart for God and his purposes. Uh, you can connect those as you will or won't with the first exhortation in that verse. Um, there might be some connections there that a person could see. Some other closing thoughts. Unlike the teachings that we have looked at previously, the laying on of hands is nowhere commanded in the Bible, per se, nor are there any specific promises attached to this practices. However, the example of the early Christians shows us that they often did lay hands on others for a variety of reasons, usually to convey some good thing to another person, as we've seen. So it seems that when the practice will help us to convey a blessing to another person, we would do well to do it also. But it's not required. It seems that this teaching is not important so much because the laying on of hands itself is important. I've thought about this considerably. Perhaps this teaching is important more because God graciously wants us to know that he wants to use us to bless each other that he wants us to assist others in receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit and to assist them in giving the Holy Spirit to us, that he wants us to give us special responsibilities of service in his kingdom, and that he wants to use us 
to heal each other and to be healed by each other. What shall I do then? What, what, do, what do Christians do? What do disciples do with this teaching? Here are a few suggestions. I would suggest observe how Jesus and the early Christians used the laying on of hands. When it seems appropriate, do the same thing. Lay hands on others. Let hands be laid on you if the occasion requires it. Be blessed and bless others. Receive the gift of the Holy Spirit yourself and help others receive him. Give others special work to do in God's kingdom and accept such work yourself. And finally, heal others and be healed. There's a lot more possible in the Christian church than many people think. What's next? Well, we are going to continue with our teachings on the primary things about the Anointed One. And we have looked at the laying on of hands now. So the next time, as you might well guess, we're going to look at resurrection of dead ones. On our six-pointed star, we're coming around the bottom from the laying on of hands to the resurrection of dead ones. I thank you for having listened to this teaching on the laying on of hands. I hope that it has been a blessing to you and expands your vision of what God has in store for his disciples. I would also at this point I'd like to review a little bit about what we I've taken uh, people through. Uh, most recently, I've shared with you the primary things about the Anointed One. Uh, these are the subjects that have come up, as you can see them listed in Hebrews chapter 6, verses 1 and 2. Number one is changing of one's thinking. Two is faith toward God. All of the threes have to do with the baptisms, baptism with water, baptism with the Holy Spirit, baptism with fire. Our, on this particular one was number four, the laying on of hands. And as you can see, I have two more in the hopper ready to come out, the resurrection of dead ones and eternal judgment. So look for those to be available soon. Also, even preceding those, there were some even more basic teachings about the fundamentals of the Christian faith in a series called First Steps on the Way. On the, on the way. They start with the most simple expression of the gospel and work their way up to a full uh, kerygma, that is, those things that were taught initially to people who were interested in the Christian faith. So one is entitled God's Word Like an Onion. You'll have to see that to know what that's about. An Anointed One Having Been Lastingly Crucified. That's an English translation of just two Hebrew words, but you need so many in English to get it out. Number three, missing the mark. Number four, foremost things. Five, the most fundamental teaching. Six, the rest of the kerygma. Kerygma means the proclamation made by a herald. And seven, the most excellent announcement, which is my own uh, collation of the uh, elements that are given by the apostles as they proclaimed this message initially to new believers. So there you have it. Uh, you can find all of these on the uh, internet and YouTube. They are listed under my name, Martin Kessler, M-A-R-T-I-N-K-O-E-S-T-L-E-R. -E -E and just enter that into the search engine on, on YouTube and you can see a list of all of these. One of these days I'll, I'll get that a little bit better organized, but they're available. Thank you for watching and have a most blessed day or evening wherever you are in the day.